folks, it's just that easy. Hey folks, it's just that easy. You mix it up, you fix it up, you do it yourself. He can turn your little shack into a first class castle. Save you time and money and a great big hassle. Hey folks, it's just that easy. You mix it up, you fix it up, you sand it down, you paint it brown, you measure twice, you cut it once. It's just that easy. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the Ask Shell webcast. I'm Michael Gibson, General Manager of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. And to my right is uh, the one and only Shell Buzzy himself. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, to the show this morning. It is Sunday, January 13th, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. So as we move east, it gets a bit later in the morning, but we'd like to thank you for being with us today. And uh, today, as usual, we'll be answering questions from our House Smart Club members which we get many, many questions through our website. And what we do is we pick through the best ones and we use those as examples during the show. So if you're a House Smart Club member, first, thanks for uh, signing up and we appreciate you being a member. If not, please sign up. It takes a few seconds and you might even be lucky enough to hear Shell answer your question during the show, which is every Sunday at 9, right on AskShell.com. So thanks for joining us and I'd like to welcome and introduce uh, Shell Buzzy. Thank you very much there, Mike, and uh, it is 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings, folks, just so that you are aware, because uh, we do like you to be with us from uh, the start of the show until the end of the show, or any time after the show has been uh, broadcasted, you can uh, pull it out of the library and uh, give it a view. It's just that easy. Mike, let's go for the first uh, email. Okay. So the first email. We would like to insulate the ceiling of our crawl space in our 40-year-old home and are considering either spraying a closed cell insulation, so spray foam insulation, between the floor joists, which would also cover the, the domestic water pipes, or nailing a rigid polystyrene insulation to the floor joists. They're leaning towards the spray foam first as they think it would be easier. Which would you recommend between those two options? Well, you know, that's a good question, first of all. Number one is, why are you considering insulating a crawl space or at least the ceiling in the crawl space, which happens to be the underside of your subfloor. So really the most important thing is the efficiency level that you're looking for and also the, uh, the type of insulation which you've indicated, either the foam uh, or the bat insulation, which may as well be considered here, or reflective foil insulation. Now I'm going to suggest very strongly the foil insulation is going to be by far the best approach. Not to say that the foam isn't a good uh, approach to take. The only problem with foam on a subfloor or the underside of the subfloor, you now really um, will take and seal up all areas of that joist and underside of subfloor area, meaning that if you ever wanted to do anything in the form of uh, wiring, if you wanted to do anything as far as venting, if you wanted to do anything as far as plumbing, it may be something that uh, would be getting in the road. So the foam would be second choice, bad insulation would be third choice. So any one of the uh, foil products would be my first choice. Now there's a number of foil products on the market today sold at the different retail uh, locations and box stores. The one that I quite readily use, which is readily available across Western Canada and throughout the USA, and that is a product called Reflectex. And Reflectex is just as it sounds. Now, the benefits of the reflective foil, Reflectex, it's stapled on and taped at the seams. But keep in mind, you can open that product up at any time by cutting it, and after doing whatever it is that you're going to be adding, like wiring or plumbing uh, or uh, possibly a telephone system or a cable uh, TV system, anything of that nature, you very simply cut between the joists, drop the panel of the uh, Reflectex down, do whatever it is you're going to do, put it back up to the place, and seal it with the reflective foil tape, which uh, is one of the optional accessory items with the reflective foil. So that would be my number one choice. 
Another thing by using reflective foil that you do gain the heat in the event if you have a heated floor above, be it either radiant heat or even electric uh, uh, heating pads underneath ceramic floors and bathrooms and kitchens because radiant heat will give you 360 degrees or 300 this circle uh, around the, the wiring or piping that you're using. So you do get that benefit because you won't lose it to a cold crawl space. And when you have that sort of effect, you get that gain of uh, warm floors or warmer floors than you would have, for example, losing, uh, you might say, half or 160 degrees, 100 and, uh, from 360 to uh, 180, I should say, shouldn't I? 180 degrees. So when, when you're doing that, you got to think of all your options. Uh, keep in mind that anybody is selling you uh, different optional items for insulating the underside of your subfloor, they're going to be selling as the best the item that they are selling as far as a service to install or apply. So my choices would be reflective foil first. Second to that, the spray-on, the, the closed foam. And then the third option would be bat insulation, be it rock wool or fiberglass uh, with a vapor barrier, and then insulated at the box joist. Uh, now, when I say the box joist, I mean out at the, uh, uh, the header joist or out at the rimmer joist. And that's the ones that go around the perimeter of your home. And uh, using foam, closed foam seal layer is a good idea. And the reason for that, it, it seals any areas that may be allowing drafts or cold air uh, or moisture to get in, moisture in the form of relative humidity. So all of those things being said and taken into consideration, we just simply give you that choice. Uh, but again, as I say, reflective foil. You get that heat back, your floors get warmer, and uh, you certainly uh, you get back the energy that you're putting out now, be it a forced air heating system, be it electric uh, baseboard or convection type of wall heaters, or even anything in the form of uh, uh, fireplaces and et cetera. Okay, so... Uh, Good on you. Good question, and uh, happy to uh, uh, take care of that in that manner. Um, Mike, let's go for the second uh, email. We're actually out of time for this segment, so we'll have to take a quick break. Um, but actually, I wanted to point out something to our viewers this morning. Um, on our website, there's a search box just above where you see Shell and I right now. If you type keeping the heat in, there's actually a link to the, uh, the government document and images and photos and all that kind of stuff, outlining how to properly insulate basements, crawl spaces, attics, all, all those different things. So if, if you're interested in more information and you're on our website, just uh, type keeping the heat in, and that will take you to the uh, federal government website where you can download their, their uh, brochure. They used to give it out for print, but uh, there's only a few left, and we probably have most of them. So you have to download it off their website now, which is, which is fine. And if you're watching us on the Internet, you can download it from their site. So... Please stay with us. We'll take our first break, and we'll be back. And we have another question about insulation, but this time it's about insulating a ceiling. And now, Ask Shell, brought to you by Springs RV Resort, a proud member of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. Folks, it has been one year since Frankie and I bought our own RV lot at the Springs RV Resort in Harrison Hot Springs. That's right, we bought our own lot, built a beautiful deck and gazebo, and have had a wonderful summer. Our kids and grandkids love how close we are. In less than an hour, they can make it out to visit us, splashing in the heated pool or relaxing by the fire. The Springs RV Resort is rated one of the top RV resorts in North America. And now we know why. The amenities are first class, from the spa-like bathrooms to the beautiful gardens. But don't wait till next summer to purchase or rent your own RV lot. The resort is over 70% sold, so right now is the time to buy. Folks, visit the Springs RV Resort in Harrison for a tour and ask about their special fall pricing or visit online at springsrv.com.
And welcome back to the Ask Shell webcast. Uh, I'm Michael Gibson, General Manager of Shell Buzzy's HouseSmart Home Services. Tim Wright is uh, Shell Buzzy, the HouseSmart guy himself. And right now we're answering emails that have been sent to our office through our website from our HouseSmart Club members. So without further ado, we'll get into further emails. Um, the next email, Shell, uh, the person is asking, when our house was built in 77, the ceiling was on two, two foot centers. They gyp rocked to the trusses, then blew in insulation. Now it's sagging down between the trusses. Can a person strap over the old gyp rock with 1x4 on 1 foot centers and re gyp rock and spray the new area without risk of moisture developing in the airspace between the two layers? Or their second option, which they say yuck, so I'm guessing they don't want to do that, <laughs> is pulling down the old ceiling and then strapping and replacing with new and re spraying the whole area. So, which uh, of the two options do you recommend or neither? Well, very good questions, Mike. And, uh, you know, some of the older homes, and certainly back in 77, uh, trusses have always been on two-foot centers. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that the insulation quality and the vapor barrier quality of installation is very important and very likely has been a concern with this particular uh, project, being that they are having issues with sagging drywall between the trusses or between the centers of two foot. Now, you may find that this particular house has uh, half-inch drywall uh, on the ceiling. And half-inch drywall on the ceiling is not really what I would be recommending. In fact, I'm very surprised to find that it is half-inch drywall because uh, uh, code in most areas, in fact, I would venture a guess in all areas, with the exception of those that have or uh, haven't got the uh, concern with inspections taking place, but 5 eighths fireboard or fire-coated drywall becomes the uh, uh, product on ceilings, and that's 5 eighths of an inch in thickness rather than half inch. Now, having said that, uh, 5 eighths certainly is adequate between two-foot centers. But being that this has uh, been made reference uh, uh, to the concern of half inch, then I'm going to suggest that it very likely is a, uh, an issue with uh, moisture leakage and uh, dampness being allowed to form up in the uh, roof cavity, or some people say the attic cavity. And why I say that is that up in the attic, if you have very poor... Uh, draft proofing around plumbing pipes, uh, electric wiring, uh, chimneys, uh, any of those, uh, the actual access, I should say, to the, uh, uh, the cavity as well, all those areas in a uh, pressurized environment below, and a pressurized environment below is a forced air furnace system blowing air from the, uh, the duct registers into the living cavity, will find leakage up into the, uh, uh, the roof or the, uh, the attic. Now, another area of leakage is the uh, fan or the exhaust fan in a bathroom or a laundry room or a kitchen. And all of those items will allow moisture to be extracted from the living cavity up into the roof cavity. And uh, with that taking place, dampness will form in the form of condensation on the underside of roof sheeting. And that's where today uh, any homes that are being sold of the older uh, type or older uh, vintage, the air leakage tear, uh, carrying moisture up into the roof attic cavity, that moisture now has a, a problem with the likes of uh, condensing on the underside of the roof sheeting, causing dampness in that roof cavity eventually finding itself down into the area where the drywall, the backside of the drywall and the vapor barrier. In some of those older homes, there is no vapor barrier per se, certainly not like a polyethylene vapor barrier, which is plastic. It will be the old type of baths that are actually laid into place with a tarred paper back. And uh, they weren't as good as uh, uh, the poly vapor barriers that we use uh, uh, of the more recent vintage. So those are all items that will cause the, uh, the, the, uh, the actual sagging of the drywall. And, uh, but having said all that, and not to really get away from the question at hand here, 
uh, can we strap the ceiling and then reapply? Well, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, you can do that. Keep in mind, depending on the amount of sagging that's taking place, you may be uh, uh, faced with a fair amount of shimming in order to keep your uh, uh, strapping uh, nice and uh, flat and uh, certainly giving you that uh, sealing uh, drywall application that's not going to be uh, interfered with any uh, sagging, uh, causing that to be a bulging uh, of the strapping on the ceiling to receive the, the uh, and I'm going to suggest 5H drywall uh, for sure. So those are items that you'd want to uh, consider as a uh, uh, a repair or a, uh, uh, a system that's going to uh, correct your problem. Now, when you do a reapplication on a ceiling, it's not necessary if you're going to be putting uh, crown moldings in place around the perimeter. And the reason why I say that is that uh, uh, putting drywall, uh, mud, and uh, paper tape uh, may be something that you uh, would like to stay away from, especially in that right angle. Whereas crown moldings can really pick that uh, uh, situation uh, up and uh, take care of it for you. The only thing that you'd have to do is once the drywall is applied on your strapping, after it's been shimmed and nice and flat, then all you'd have to do is ground the perimeter with an acoustical caulking which seals a space between the drywall and the wall drywall, or, or simply saying the ceiling and the wall, separating it and sealing it. And then go about your, uh, uh, your taping and mudding, uh, obviously before you'd ever put the acoustical caulking up. But then once you've got all the taping, filling and finishing, and the acoustical caulking applied around the perimeter, now you can apply your, your crown moldings, which will cover up that, uh, that seam or joint. And it makes it just that easy. So venting of any exhaust venting from bathrooms, laundry rooms, etc. Make sure that they are sealed with uh, uh, polyurethane foam from a can up on top of the ceiling. Uh, seal all the wire uh, coming, up, uh, coming up through your walls and uh, allowing the air to come in around your switches and your uh, duplex plug receptacles and sealing those and also any of your plumbing stacking, any of your uh, uh, access of wires, be it uh, for telephone, etc. Any air that's allowed up into that roof cavity from the living space is going to create a problem if it has a high amount of moisture in it. And also don't forget to insulate around the uh, uh, the access to the attic cavity, and that's by weather stripping it. Okay, so all those things uh, are covered on our website, askshell.com. Go to the question and answers, Q&As, and put in there draft proofing. Draft proofing, that's the terminology, and they'll go through all the process, and it's also in the booklet that uh, Michael made reference to uh, earlier, and that was keeping the heat in booklet, that is available through Energy Mines and Resources Canada. So there you have it, uh, and uh, good luck to you, and I'm sure that uh, you'll overcome the problem of sagging. It will be gone forever. Mike? And on that note, we'll take another break. And just before we go to our, our second break, um, we did have an article in the province from about six weeks ago regarding draft proofing. So if they search for draft proofing, there's a recent article that Shell wrote uh, I think it was about mid-November, and uh, they can find out more about draft proofing there too. So That's the people that take the province newspaper. Yeah, that's correct. Or it's also on our website too, yeah. so they can find it that way. So when we come back, we have another question from one of our Housemark Club members, and it will be about uh, Worthy Bird, which is a, a way to vent your attic space. And uh, we'll be right back, so please stay with us. And now, Ask Shell, brought to you by West Coast Molding and Millwork, a proud member of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. Folks, when people ask me who they should contact about a home finishing project, I always recommend West Coast Molding and Millwork. 
in the West Coast showroom, you'll see more home finishing options than you ever thought possible. West Coast has a huge inventory of moldings, but they also have stair components, including handrails, wood, or metal spindles, and all the rail fittings to go with it. And with their own millwork shop, West Coast can match any molding or even build you a freestanding spiral staircase. If you're planning a reno or a new home project, make sure to have West Coast molding on your team. The West Coast staff have years of experience and super product knowledge. Call West Coast Molding and Millwork at 604-513-1138 or visit westcoastmolding.com. It's just that easy, folks. Welcome back to the Ask Shell webcast. Thanks for being with us this morning. And uh, we'll get to more emails right away from our House Smart Club members. So I have another question for Shell that we came through our website. And it's coming from a, a person they said they're in the northwest area of Calgary. Uh, recently, after some hail damage, they had to have their shingles replaced on their, their roof. <clears throat> he, he noticed that after the work was done, the contractor replaced his whirly bird with a hooded 5 to 6 inch gravity vent. Should he go back to having his old whirly bird replaced, or is the new vent equal to or better with respect to performing the ventilation services needed in the attic? Well, that's a good one. That is a good one, because especially when they had a whirly bird uh, on the roof previous. And uh, the whirly birds, folks, uh, and please don't take me as a negative person on whirlybirds, I am not. But I can tell you where I do become very concerned about whirlybirds is the way they're installed. Because I would say, without a doubt, 9 out of 10 homes that I would drive by would have a whirlybird or one of the turbine vents installed incorrectly. And having them installed incorrectly just don't do anything at all. So they're up there spinning their wheels and uh, not doing anything in the form of exhaust venting, which they should be doing. Now, first of all, a whirly bird, the better term to use, whirly bird is actually a brand. And a whirly bird, so we'll continue to use that brand. There is other brands like the, uh, uh, oh, the Duraflow, for example, they make a PVC unit, which is a different configuration as far as design. But they are turbines. They create wind in the area of the turbine, and that wind becomes exhausting of air out of the roof cavity. Or if you were to be standing on the roof next to the, uh, uh, the turbine vent, you would actually feel the air moving. Or some people say, I can feel the wind blowing. But... I have had people phone me and say, Shell, my insulation is actually forming up in a little pile underneath the vent. Well, that should not happen. And if that is happening, which I find it highly uh, suggestive that it's uh, someone trying to pull my leg, because it would have to be so close to it and such a, a demand for air, starving the amount of air that's moving, to cause that turbulence in order to almost like a, a cyclone to uh, suck it up. So uh, I would be a little hesitant to even go any further explaining uh, that particular scenario, but I can explain it very well by following through as to why the difference in the vents. So let me uh, go through the difference in the vents and very likely as to why the, uh, the roofing contractor has uh, decided to take away the, uh, the turbine and put on the units, which they mentioned, reference to gravity, which is actually uh, convection and convection vents. Now, there is a formula. It is a national code formula based upon roof cavity venting. And it's, uh, it's been changed over the years by different... Uh, uh, cities, municipalities, provincially, uh, federally, all of these different uh, uh, areas of uh, responsible uh, uh, code people that it's went from four 
uh, square feet for every uh, um, 100 square feet. It, you know, it's, it, it's, it's all over the, the, uh, the, the board. But I, and there's no real restriction on it as long as you're meeting the requirements of the code. So what I like to say, for every 100 square feet of insulation, you want uh, two square feet of venting. So I, I'm not, let me go back on that. I'm sorry. I, I made an error myself on that. For every 200 square feet of insulation on the ceiling, you want one square foot of venting. I'll repeat that. For every 200 square feet, so if you've got a room that is... Uh, uh, let's say 100 by 10, then that, that's 1,000 square feet. And uh, that 1,000 square feet, that would be 5 square feet of, of venting. So for every 200 square feet, you want 1 square foot of venting. So that way you have got uh, not only the venting taken care of, once that air leakage or moisture or whatever it is that you're venting heat out of the attic cavity or roof cavity as we relate to that's what is so important to get that air out of there by means of convection or using the turbines but using the turbines based upon the installation instructions also i want to make reference that Half of the venting in the roof cavity should be in the soffits, that's the under the eaves, and the other half on the roof. And on the roof, it's normally best policy to have your venting as close to the ridge as possible. As close to the ridge as possible. That's why a lot of roofers will elect to use ridge venting, which actually becomes now part of the roofing membrane to keep out uh, the weather, uh, rain, snow, etc. So when you calculate your square footage and the amount of uh, footage required for venting, keep in mind that that figure will be cut in half for the soffit venting and the other half on the roof. Every vent that you buy be it the uh, DuraFlow type, which is a PVC plastic, or if you buy an aluminum unit, will be stamped with the actual square inches that that particular vent is capable of providing for that installation. So every soffit vent is stamped, every roof vent is stamped, every turbine is stamped. So let's go back to our 10 by 100 room area. And 10 by 100,000 square feet, we're going to divide that by two okay so if you divide it by two what do you end up with you end up with 200 into 1000 five square feet so for every 200 square feet you want one square foot of venting so we get five square feet so that's two and a half square feet of venting in the soffit two and a half square feet on the roof now square footage you don't take a a vent and measure it and say, oh, that's 8 inches by 8 inches, that's 64 inches of venting. No, that is wrong. Take the square inches that are stamped on the actual unit and base it on a square foot is 144 square inches, so 12 by 12, 144 square inches in one square foot. Once you've got that all together, now you make the choice what type of venting on the roof. If you want and your roof is a, a desired roof for a turbine, by all means use a turbine. But I always suggest put it at the back so you only see the half of the turbine from the road or from the curb appeal. Sitting out in front on the front exposed uh, uh, of your home just don't look nice. So that's why I'm sure that the uh, uh, the roofing contractor has chose to go with the DuraFlow this time uh, or the DuraFlow type, which is a low uh, profile. We quite often use the term mushroom vents. Okay, so mushroom vents or the ridge vents for on the roof and your regular soffit ventings for the under the eave venting. It's just that easy. The most important thing is 
the number that you calculate from the formula that I gave you. So take the square footage of all the insulation, square footage, that's the dimensions, divide that by 200. For every 200 square feet of insulation, you want one square foot of venting, half of which, that's 50% in the soffit, half on the roof. It's just that easy. Mike? Thank you very much for that answer. And I should uh, also let people know that at our House Smart Home Services Referral Network office, we do have roofers available to them uh, in different areas of Canada. So if you do need a new roof, please contact us at our office, which is uh, toll-free 1-888-266-8806 or 604-542-2200. If you're in the greater Vancouver area, or you can visit the website askshell.com, and we have a whole list of roofers there that are reputable. And one thing that we should comment on is that if you're dealing with your roof and the roofer does not talk about ventilation, don't deal with that roofer. Make sure they'll talk to you about what you need for ventilation to properly um, install the roof. Because if you don't do ventilation, your, your roof shingles will bake in the last five years rather than 30 or 40. And they will not have warranty. Coverage. Absolutely. Absolutely. So please stay with us. We'll be right back after this quick break. And now Ask Shell, brought to you by 21st Century Roofers, a proud member of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. Folks, there are a lot of different roofing options these days, and I'm always being asked, what type of roof is the best? If you're considering asphalt shingles, fiberglass laminate shingles, metal roofing, or SBS torch on roofing, you should talk to Andrew at 21st Century Roofers. They've been in business since 1978, and for a good reason. With top-notch products, craftsmanship, and service, 21st Century Roofers work hard every day to earn and maintain their reputation. 21st Century Roofers are a master elite certified GAF installer, and they're a local company with thousands of satisfied customers. Call 21st Century Roofers at 604-581-1666. That's 604-581-1666. It's just that easy. Welcome back to the Ask Shell webcast. I'm Michael Gibson, General Manager of Shell Bussy's House Smart Home Services. And uh, right now, we're answering email questions from our House Smart Club members. And this one thing I wanted to touch on is uh, we're also available a couple other places online other than just our website. So you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So the easiest way to find us if you're on uh, any of those social networking websites, just type Shell Buzzy, S-H-E-L-L, and his last name is B-U-S-E-Y. I've seen it spelled many, many, many different ways. Uh, so 39 different ones. The proper way is Shell Buzzy, B-U-S-E-Y. If you search for that on either YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you'll find us. So please, uh, please connect with us on those social networking sites, and you'll get information uh, right away, right to your uh, – often people get right to their iPhone. So that's a good way to find us. So please don't forget about us on those websites. So we'll get right back into the emails. So the next email – there's a noise that's coming from their ductwork. It sounds like a dripping noise, which they thought might be from a dishwasher or a fridge. Uh, they've checked. There's no leaks. Uh, it gets louder when the furnace came on and quieter after it stops. Uh, it's not oil canning. It's just a steady drip, drip, drip. And he said his daughter lives in the basement, which is where the, the noise is most evident. And uh, he's hoping that he can get it fixed. He's tried blocking it, bracing it, insulating the insulation, and... Uh, can't seem to solve the problem, so he wanted to check with the expert. So what's uh, what's the cause of his dripping problem? Or well, thanks problem? very much, Mike, and that, that is uh, another good question, which really the uh, the club members, uh, folks, and thank you for joining my club, Shell Buzzy's Host Smart Club, and uh, please have your friends join as well, because the type of uh, questions that comes through the email 
are far different than what we uh, would get, for an example, uh, through a, a call-in radio program because they happen to be questions that people think of as the week goes on and they may be in the office or they may be at home in the evening when it's nice and quiet and they send off the email to us. So uh, being a club member of mine, we don't share your email addresses, so you don't have to worry about that. You're not going to get a, a whole bunch of junk mail or anything like that. If you do, then you can come after uh, our office here because I would be the one that would be responsible, and I just don't do that. Okay? But uh, I get a, uh, quite a kick out of this uh, email that uh, Michael this read, and that is the noise and the ductwork. But also he mentioned in there it's not oil canning, but it's interesting. How do they know that, that it's not oil canning? Because really, in a sense, oil canning is when you'll get a piece of metal that is uh, heated up and it will expand and it'll actually um, warp or it'll, it'll move with a bang or a real loud bang. Normally, uh, if the furnace is subjective to that, it will be the hot air plenum, which is either the top or the bottom, depending if it's a counterflow furnace or a, a, a vertical flow. So I'm going to say, uh, yes, you're correct, it's not oil canning, but it really is, in a sense, something that's very similar because it's caused by uh, having expansion through that of heat. Uh, and you did hear the comment that uh, when the furnace comes on, it's uh, worse than when the furnace is off. Well, the difference is one is expansion, the other one is contraction. So getting larger is noisier or more pronounced than when it's contracting or when it's cooling down. So I'm going to put my, uh, uh, my half morning donut, folks, on the fact that this particular click, 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 which sounds so much like a dripping uh, faucet, uh, something that's a dripping a drain, for an example, but it is the actual ducting. Uh, and in this case, the round ducting, or it could be one of the leader ducts off of the uh, uh, off of the main uh, support uh, uh, duct system that's called the trunk system. So, if you can picture, if you can picture your ducting as it's uh, heating up with the delivery of heat from the the furnace, the burner, the fan, up through the hot air plenum and then going to your trunks, uh, to the rooms, that particular uh, uh, duct, the round duct, if it's expanding, then you'll get that, that movement of tin, which is the ducting. Some people call it aluminum ducting, but in uh, most cases it's, uh, it's a galvanized ducting. And it's actually moving. It's an indication that the ducts were never sealed at the joints. And... Uh, also, the duct could be, and a lot of cases will be, over top of a piece of bridging between the, uh, the joists. Uh, that's the wood cross members between the joists. And when that takes place, what happens is that the, uh, the duct is expanding now on top of a piece of wood, and that piece of wood being the bridging, and you'll get that click, 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 because it's moving ever so uh, uh, little but enough to get that rubbing sound, which becomes the clicking sound, which be, comes to the ear, the human ear, a dripping sound. So having that particular concern, uh, the way I always like to uh, uh, correct that is to take the duct and uh, put a screw in it. Now, you know, it might say, a screw, how can I put a screw in it? I don't even know where the, uh, the ducting is. Well, I think you'll find that you will find the duct because you'll find, first of all, the, uh, the duct boot. That's the one that has the register in it in the room up top. Uh, and then you have, obviously, where the boot comes down from your subfloor, where the grill of your register is attached, and then at a right angle and go back to the main trunk and then the main trunk, if you drop a line from there back to your furnace room, you'll identify where uh, that uh, piece of uh, uh, piping or ducting is coming through. Also, if you take, for example, a, uh, a stethoscope, and you can sound where it is in between the joists, so you can identify location. 
The other way you can do it is take, if you don't have a stethoscope, but not everybody's got a stethoscope, it is one of the most used tools in my toolbox when I'm out correcting problems and noises. But in any event, take a yardstick and put your thumb over the end of the yardstick. Put your thumb over the end of the yardstick like that and put the other end of the yardstick on the area where you hear the clicking sound and then put your thumbnail up to your earlobe and you'll get the transfer of sound up the yardstick to your ear and you'll be able to sound just like a stethoscope of where that duct is. Now, once you have that, then what you can do is take, uh, uh, oh, I would, I would say always buy about a three-inch drywall screw with a self-drilling point. Go through the drywall, into the metal, and what it'll do, it'll suck that uh, uh, duct uh, to the point that it's not going to move and stopping that sound. Uh, if the uh, Obviously, if the ceiling is not finished in the basement or in the crawl space, you'll be able to uh, identify it pretty quickly and go around the duct uh, joint with duct seal. It's a, an actual duct seal that you can buy that's pre-mixed. You put it on with a, uh, uh, a, a narrow paintbrush, and it seals the duct and seals that problem. So all kinds of things to take and correct it, but a lot of it is in the installation right from the beginning. We try to get it too tight in places going over bridging, too tight in places where it's going uh, possibly through a hole in a duct or through a cutout in a duct or just resting on a uh, piece of strapping. It's just that easy, folks, but it is duct expansion causing the grief. And you can fix it just that easy. Mike? On that note, we'll take another break. And when we come back, we have a question about hardwood flooring and keeping their home at a certain humidity level or oh, um, dehumidification. Um, that is a good one, Mike. Yep, so that was coming so up, especially people, given it's winter right now. So yeah, so many people are concerned about their flooring. Yep. So we'll be right back. Please stay with us. And uh, we'll see you in about a minute. And now, Ask Shell, brought to you by Serpentine Cedar Roofing, a proud member of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. Tony Weens from Serpentine Cedar Roofing is often asked why Serpentine is so unique in the roofing business. Tony tells people that for over 30 years, their family has operated their own cedar shake mill and produced only the highest quality cedar roofing shakes. And folks, Serpentine don't cut down any trees to produce their roofing shakes. You heard right, they use only recovered, old-growth western red cedar salvaged from windfalls on the BC coast. A Serpentine Cedar Roof is the real deal. Their experienced crew can expertly install your new roof, replace or repair your existing roof, or help you with any of your roofing needs. To arrange a free estimate, visit Serpentine Cedar Roofing online at cedaristherealdeal.com. That's cedaristherealdeal.com. Welcome back to the Ask Shell webcast. I'm Mike Gibson, General Manager of Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Services. To my right is Shell Buzzy. And uh, we're taking questions right now from our House Smart Club members. And as I alluded to prior to the break, we have a question from somebody about hardwood flooring. So I'll read this off for you, Shell. I'm building a 1,400 square foot home, and it will have hardwood flooring throughout except for the two bedrooms and two bathrooms. Should we pay the extra cost to have a humidifier and or a dehumidifier attached to our furnace. So we're guessing it's a forced air furnace. So what would you recommend if they're going to have a lot of hardwood in the uh, in the home? Well, first of all, uh, Michael, I'm going to say Happy New Year to all our viewers uh, uh, today because uh, a lot of you are going to be faced with this concern in the new year. And uh, why I say that, because uh, for Christmas gifts, uh, for uh, installations yet to happen, you're going to get hardwood floors in your home. And when that takes place, you're going to be uh, all somewhat distressed if you have some of the normal concerns that I face 
Michael faces, our entire office faces, and certainly you as the homeowner really face, and that is the grief-stricken squeaky floor. Being a brand new floor and all, and uh, you weren't expecting it, you don't want it, it's something that really concerns you, stresses you out, well, first and foremost, folks, let me tell you, moisture is one of the biggest concerns today with hardwood flooring. Surprise, surprise, when do the squeaks show up? They show up in the winter months when the home is drying out, when the weather outside is dry. The colder it gets, the drier it gets. The air that's replacing the air within the home for your combustion uh, uh, process through your furnace and your venting, be it uh, bathroom exhaust venting, uh, kitchen exhaust venting, HRV heat recovery venting, uh, all of these different venting processes that take place allow outside air to come into your home to replace the existing air that's being exhausted. And when that takes place, moisture levels come down. When moisture levels come down, floors start to shrink. And when floors start to shrink, floors start to squeak. And when they start to squeak, boy, oh boy, I tell you, we start, we can, we can actually tell when the weather starts getting cold in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and yes, even in British Columbia along the coastline where we quite often make reference to the fact that it's a very damp, moist environment in the greater uh, Fraser Valley and Vancouver. So let me stress one thing, and it's very important, and that is moisture levels in the home. We have them on our website in many, many places. In the question and answer area, this put in moisture problems. The concern with moisture levels is controlling moisture levels and knowing what moisture levels really are. And if you don't know what it is and you have a humidifier on your furnace and you have all the main functional items to correct and exhaust the moisture to maintain a level, keep in mind that that is what you want it to be is controlled. And bathrooms, showers, baths, kitchens, boiling, uh, uh, cooking, all these items will create moisture within the home. Moisture in the basement, a damp basement, floor, allowing con concrete floors, allowing moisture to uh, wick up through and vent into the home. The moisture level, if you can constantly maintain it in your home, and still control the situation within the home based upon that of the uh, wood itself and the type of wood that you have is very important. Right now, comfortably speaking, 35 to 45 percent relative humidity is really what wood wants. Wood loves it, but if it doesn't have it and it happens to already be uh, conditioned to that type of uh, moisture level and you now start drying out your environment, that piece of wood is going to get smaller through shrinkage. So being in a room that now you're going to give it more than what it uh, should have or less, then less is going to cause the squeaks. One of the first suggestions I always suggest to people is to follow the measurement of relative humidity in your home based upon the control point that we print from the uh, Energy, Mines and Resources uh, uh, booklet, Keeping the Heat In. It's in that. If you want to go to our website, it's there. And also we have it in many areas. In fact, I believe it's on our homepage right now. And if that's being the case, uh, if not, I'm sure Michael will see that it does get there to, to find you as the concerned homeowner. Now, 40% at zero outside at room temperature, 21 degrees Celsius inside, is the no problem zone. As soon as it goes up, your floor will start to expand. 
As soon as it comes down, it'll start to shrink. Shrinking is the noisy one. When you get moisture going up and expansion, then you'll find that your floor will look a little wavy. And that is because it's got more moisture than it really requires. So number one, whoever installs your flooring, make sure that they've checked everything from moisture quantity in the floor that's going uh, in. Make sure they check the moisture within the home that is going in. Make sure they check the flooring uh, that's going to be the subfloor that's going to be applied to. All that has to be uh, controlled. Then take your regular bathroom exhaust fans and take the main switch off, which is a single pole switch. Take that uh, single pole switch and convert it to a dehumidistat. A dehumidistat. That's one you can set. And you can, normally they come with a little uh, badge right on them telling you exactly what the temperature outside, the temperature inside, and what your moisture rating should be. Or you can have that information that we provide for you on our website. So taking that into consideration, controlling the moisture, and one of the best control points is your windows. If you see your windows got moisture condensation on it, you know you've reached dew point because the dew point is condensation from the relative humidity based upon the amount of uh, moisture in the air inside your home. So when you install flooring, be it laminate flooring, allow for expansion around the perimeter of the room. And you want at least to have a quarter inch uh, per length of room and same in width. If you're applying or installing the, uh, uh, the solid wood flooring, that's solid three-quarter inch or five-eighths or half inch, there's where you got to be so concerned that you're having it applied, installed by people that will use wax underlays, poly underlays, and uh, uh, felt underlays, all these different underlays that are required to maintain that uh, status quo, not allowing moisture to get up underneath uh, the floor, say from a damp crawl space, that sort of thing. And then your engineered floor, which is normally, uh, it could be anywhere from three-eighths of an inch to half inch. It's a plywood inner layer with a solid uh, piece of uh, wood veneer on top up to an eighth of an inch thick. And incidentally, folks, don't be concerned about that on engineered floor. That eighth of an inch is going to last you every bit as long as any solid wood flooring. So my preference is engineered flooring. You can either glue it down or nail it down or you can float it. All of those things are so important, but the most important thing is when you have your flooring installed, make sure the reputation of that flooring installer is on your side, what you want. Get some references from them, and we have those people available through our referral network across the country. So when in doubt, don't pout. Let Shell help you out right here on the webcast every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Better go back to Mike. And on that note, we have to take our final break. So we'll be right back. And uh, our last question is related to moisture as well, but uh, they have a musty odor in their home. So that's a question we're going to address when you come back. Please stay with us, and we'll see you in about a minute. Folks, what is House Smart? Well, it's 10 years of experience putting a program together that has really worked for you, the homeowner. It's free for your use. We charge the trade, and there's no upcharge whatsoever to you, the homeowner. Also, they're certified. We certify them. We make sure, good, better, best, they are the best because they're right there with me on their shoulder. My brand, folks, you can be assured that you're going to get the job done right. Hi, Shell Buzzy here for my Shell Buzzy's Home Improvements. Right now is a perfect time to talk with our full-service home renovation department. They're the experts with kitchen and bathroom designs and renovations, additions, basement suites, and all exterior repairs. Projects big or small, folks, we do them all. Folks, my name, Shell Buzzy, assures you the job is being done right. Call us at 604 542-2236 or online askshell.com
And thanks for staying with us. This is the Ask Shell webcast. I'm Michael Gibson, General Manager of the Shell Buzzy House Smart Home Services Referral Network. And to my right is Shell Buzzy. And we have time for one more question this week, so I'll get right into it. Um, within the last few months, they've noticed a strong musty odor in their home. It's strongest by the garage entrance and in the front of the home. They have a seven-foot partially finished basement and crawl space unfinished storage area down there as well. So that's what's uh, above or below where they're smelling the musty odor. There are days where it's noticeable, days where it's not noticeable. really hits you to come through the front door of the house. They don't know where the odor is coming from. So can you help them in terms of uh, what might be causing that musty smell in their home? Absolutely, Mike. And uh, musty odors, uh, folks, are caused normally from raw concrete. Raw concrete will allow moisture to wick up through it or through it on a vertical wall, especially on the older homes and the alkalinity in the concrete. Uh, once it gets uh, carried to the inside of the home and evaporation takes place, that uh, gives you that uh, musty, mildewy odor. Another thing is cardboard boxes, cardboard boxes, storage boxes, uh, uh, old furniture, uh, suitcases, uh, anything that is of a uh, uh, an encased uh, product, be it like uh, boxes of food, uh, uh, old trunks, all these things are very susceptible to excessive moisture and picking up the odor of the alkalinity that will emit from the concrete uh, once that water uh, in the form of groundwater wicks through and evaporates. And uh, you may have nothing more than a sign showing the concern that uh, you have as a white powdery material on the concrete. Now, you may even have a painted floor, uh, and the painted floor has got some uh, paint peeling off it and this white powder showing up uh, where the paint's peeling. All of those things are just saying moisture is evident, moisture is going to give you this odor, and never ever take cardboard boxes, for an example, and uh, pile flat on uh, a concrete floor. Always set them up on uh, straps of wood, for an example. You can even take uh, some dimensional lumber, like 2x4 two or 2x2, two two, uh, and set it on the floor and then pile your box of storage on top of that, allowing air to flow underneath. Because moisture in anything that will accept moisture will cause an odor, okay? Even uh, old uh, uh, leather jackets and uh, uh, leather attaché cases, all of these things, and I did hear in the uh, email that there was some unfinished basement area, and uh, front doors, the reason why front doors, because front doors are uh, moved uh, in the form of opening and closing, opening and closing. So therefore, it works just like a, a bellows because it draws air. That air obviously will come up through uh, registers. It'll come up around the floor. It'll come up around through uh, closets. All of those things will cause that uh, that concern. Now, what do you do about it? How do you correct it? Well, you can do it very simply by taking the raw concrete and covering it. Now, the floor, you can use like a Delta FL, which is a dimple plastic product that you can put down on concrete. And you can even put like laminate flooring over top of that. You don't need to put any plywood down. But uh, if you're going to put, say, a lino down or tiles down, that sort of thing, then you put the dimple plastic down, then put the plywood down, and underlayment, and then put your uh, tiles on top. But on a wall, uh, you would use uh, dimensional lumber and finish it like you would uh, any basement, basement finishing, we call it. If it's a crawl space, then you can very simply put up against the concrete. After you seal the concrete wall, uh, you would, and oh, I should I should have mentioned that the basement finishing detail, we have that on our website, askshell.com, uh, in the Q&A, question and answer area, basement finishing, showing you how to go about the, the dimensional lumber and the uh, insulation and the drywall uh, and the vapor barriers all there showing you the proper process. Now, crawl space. Uh, seal the concrete floor and wall in the crawl space using a product called Aqua Seal. And Aqua Seal is available at the likes of most uh, of your Cloverdale paint stores uh, throughout Western Canada. So, uh, it, it, and Zypex makes one as well, and that's spelled X Y P E X. It's like Xerox. Okay, so Zypex and uh, the Cloverdale paint Aqua Seal. And spray it on. Put it into a trigger bottle. Fill it up and go. Or you can put it into one of the pump uh, uh, fertilizer sprayers or uh, 
uh, any one of the pump-up type of sprayers and spray it on the concrete, let it take what it wants, floor and wall, and then insulate that wall with the rigid foam insulation, minimum one inch thick. Okay, so that stops the cold drawing the moisture and the wicking and causing the concern with moisture. But uh, if you want to just get rid of the uh, odor, uh, but it's not going to correct the problem, you could have it come back. But if they say you're, you're selling your home and you're wanting to show it, then uh, uh, baking the cookies and what have you, that, uh, that's all gone by the wayside with must. They'll find must. Uh, home inspectors will find it after the fact. So it's better to do it right and uh, get it done the right way the first time, which I always say, good, better, best, why worry about the rest. When the good is better, the better is best. And that's what the how to, the what to, the where to, the why to, the when to, the who to, here on the webcast is all about, folks. So when in doubt, just give us a call and we'll take care or become a member of the club and send us an email. That's what I'm here to help you get the job done. Mike? And on that note, we're out of time for this week. Uh, we had one question that we couldn't get to, but we'll answer that next week. And that was about uh, refinishing a uh, concrete floor in the parking garage of a, uh, a condo building. So we'll oh, do that next yeah. week. And I want to thank everyone for viewing the show today. Keep in mind that you can watch it on our website anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just go to AskShell.com. Tell your friends, tell your family. It's free. We don't pack up full of uh, 20 minutes of commercials in a one-hour show, so there's lots of great content. And uh, that's about it for the week. So I'll turn it over to Shell, and we'll, uh, we'll see you next Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific on our website. Thank you very much, Mike. And, uh, folks, I'd like to, on behalf of the House Smart team, and certainly our family to yours, the very best in the new year. Happy New Year, prosperous new year, and a healthy new year. And next week, we'll bring another show of information, education. That's what I am bound to uh, go into the world continuously doing, is teaching you how your home works. Until next week, from myself, from our producer here, Mr. Jim Ballard and Michael the manager here at House Smart. Have a great one. Love you all. Bye-bye for now. Hey, folks, it's just that easy. Hey, folks, it's just that easy. You mix it up, you fix it up, you do it yourself. He can turn your little shack into a first-class castle. Save you time and money and a great big hassle. Hey, folks, it's just that easy. You mix it up, you fix it up, you sand it down, you paint it brown, you measure twice, you cut it once. It's just that easy.